So moving on from that, I want to talk to uh, Tom Farrell about scratch building his layout. And this is going, this is going to be a series that you're not going to want to miss. Uh, because Tom, with his modeling skills and his capabilities, uh, and keep in mind, it's all scratch built. So Tom, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim, for the introduction. And um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with my old rustic buff, an old Gothic ON30 model railroad, but it was 15 years in the making and one afternoon to take it out. Um, I sold my house that it was in two years ago. And a year, this past summer, we purchased another home and I've started a new uh, rustic buff and old Gothic. And um, I'm on the bench work now. Uh, well, that's what I'm featuring this evening. And um, I'm actually on the wiring now, but that'll be a later issue. But uh, if we could fire up the PowerPoint. <clears throat> <clears throat> This was a photograph from my uh, old rustic buff and old Gothic railroad. I'm referring to it as version one and the new one is version two. <clears throat> but I model an ON30 and uh, everything on the layout is scratch built. Uh, Jim was kind enough to feature me in a modeling lifestyle. So if you wanna see some more of my scratch builds, uh, that would be your ticket. So we go to the next slide. <clears throat> this layout's my seventh layout. And um, I began model railroading when I was seven years old with N scale. And in 2005, I switched to ON30. <clears throat> my last rustic buff and old Gothic, although it photographed well, the photograph on the right is one of my personal favorites. <clears throat> it, wasn't, it, it had some shortcomings on the, um, it was a, analog, it was um, not DCC, it wasn't really set up for operation. Although I do running, I do enjoy running trains round and round. My next layout uh, will be DCC and uh, I could still run trains round and round, but uh, it will be set up for operation. And my theme for this railroad is no compromises. You know, everything has an order when you, theoretically, when you build a model railroad, my last one, I jumped around so much. I do backgrounds, I do bench work, I do wiring. This time I'm trying to go in a logical order, as difficult as that may be, <laughs> but that's <laughs> that's my plan. And uh, that's what I'm holding to at the moment. So uh, we go to the next slide. <clears throat> I started with the layout room in my new house, although it's considerably smaller than my old house, it has this great room above the garage. And uh, before I started with the model railroad, I completely remodeled this room. Uh, it's all freshly painted. I put in a vinyl planking floor and I constructed these workbenches. They're just Ikea uh, kits, you know, the, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that and butcher block tables. So those are my workbenches to the left. And at the very end is the, not shown in the large photograph is my uh, other workbench, I found a big piece of marble in an antique store that I got for a real bargain. That thing weighs over 200 pounds, that workbench. And um, the thought was to build the uh, workbenches, get them in place, then start on the layout. So we go to the next slide. After I had the room um, basically finished, I put down this blue tape. Well, the first thing I did was some sketches and I played around with some CAD programs. I am familiar with CAD, like SketchUp and some of the railroad, but I prefer to do it old school. I like to visualize things. So I first used some cardboard templates and then I wound up putting down blue uh, painter's tape, give me a rough idea what uh, how I'm gonna put the layout in. And it features basically uh, the idea was to have continuous running and point to point operation. Um, so uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the old John Armstrong, the late John, John Armstrong. He had this thing he called uh, Givens and Druthers. You know, he's the considered the Dean of model railroad layout design. 
Well, some of my givens and and druthers were uh, I wanted a minimum of a 24 inch radius, which is perfectly fine for ON30. And uh, as I mentioned, I wanted it point to point and continuous running. And I did want to set it up for operation this time. So uh, go to the next slide. So I have this, it's called Miami Benchwork from a temporary layout I had in California. So I, I live in Bloomington, Indiana and had, a, had my rustic buff and old Gothic, but I took a temporary job in California. I had an apartment there and uh, turned out to be, I was out there for like six years. So I started, I, I didn't have my table saws and drill presses and chop saws. So I sought to buy bench work. Uh, and I checked out this Miami bench work. It's tough to pronounce it. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. It's basically lock and click stuff. Um, I didn't want to throw it away. So for my island of this layout, I started with that. And um, if you look at the right there, you'll see the center of the photograph there. There are two by twos that are six foot tall. That's not part of the Miami bench work. I added that. That's for a backdrop on my island, but it, it went up extremely fast. Uh, but as you'll see, I extensively modified it. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> so the idea was on the right photograph, you'll see these runners, they're uh, one by fours. Um, I wanted to recreate with most people, referred to as L girder construction. The idea of this layout, unlike my uh, last rustic buff and old Gothic railroad, was that if I ever move this time, the layout's gonna be constructed on two inch foam that sits on this robust bench work. So if I move, theoretically, all the railroad goes with me and I leave behind the bench work. That wasn't the case in the old rustic buff and old Gothic. I had to destroy that layout and all its scenery. And if any of you have seen it, you can appreciate how much time I put into it. I didn't want to do that again. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So Part of the construction of this layout is conventional lattice work. That's on the left hand left photograph. That labyrinth of wood there is the transition between the Miami bench work and the lattice bench work. I wanted that to be a really strong uh, connection because I didn't want that island to float. If you look at the bottom right hand photograph, you'll see the island on the left and then the curves around to the lattice um, I didn't want that to move. Turns out I put so much wood into this, I was afraid the floor might cave into the garage. <laughs> so the idea is to have uh, a 20, you see how the ceiling is uh, steps down. I wanted a 20 minimum of a 24 inch backdrop all the way around. So that's, that's why I use those six foot two by twos that are everywhere. Okay. Next slide. <clears throat> you can see in the right-hand photograph, the, uh, the quote, L girder type construction is really apparent in this photograph. That really stiffened up the Miami bench work. If there's one fault to the Miami system, it's, a, it's not as rigid as I would like. I know we're only supporting model trains, but when I, uh, you know, I want this to be robust, not to move. And, and and the more wood I put on this, obviously, the stiffer it got. It's just brutally strong at the moment. We'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted was adequate storage. So one of the reasons it's taking me so long to build my bench work, I've been at it, God, like two months, three months, um, is I'm building these cabinets below the layout. So there'll be a place for everything. And uh, there'll be 
you look uh, the bottom left or the big photograph, you can see the three basically cabinets. And if you look at the photograph in the upper right, you'll see the side of the that that cabinet. To the right of that cabinet will be another set of three. So basically, there'll be six cabinets underneath the uh, <clears throat> island, and that island is uh, 16 feet long, just to put things in perspective. The other thing I do is uh, I did this on the old rustic buff and old gothic. The um, um, you see the one by it's it's a MDF fascia there. It uh, I used pine on the old rustic buff. This one's MDF. It paints better. It's smoother, and uh, <clears throat> everything uh, that you add to the island stiffens it up. I mean, it it doesn't move at all if you lean or bump it now. It is rock solid. Okay. You can see on the bottom left, or the large photograph to the left, I snuck another cabinet uh, onto the island. So there'll be six cabinets on the 16 feet of the island. Uh, basically from the light up. And then I snuck in a cabinet there on the, on the, uh, on the angle and uh, you can see it again in the upper right there. If you look at the photograph on the bottom right, you can see how I stiffened up the Miami bench work. You see all those one by fours running basically three inches from the floor. Very rigid uh, system here. And the, and the wood, choice of the wood, by the way, about 90% of the wood I purchased, I got from a, a Menards, which is like a Home Depot Lowe's that we have in the uh, Midwest. So we have Home Depot, we have Lowe's and we have Menards, but Menards carries this clear um, wood from New Zealand. It is really, really a fine quality wood. It's not exactly the least expensive wood, but it's absolutely parallel, perpendicular. There's no warpage to it. And it's fairly dense. It's not like a fir or a regular pine uh, furring that you would get at a, for construction purposes. Okay. Next slide. This is the uh, step down that connects the two halves of the island. Um, this is going to feature a uh, hand carved viaduct that I'll make out of balsa foam also have a little um, snow shed and a tunnel to the right. Um, this will be the first area that I start modeling, but I'm maintaining my discipline. I'm going to finish the bench work, finish all the wiring, put in the backdrops, and then uh, only then will I begin to uh, lay the track and put in some of the modeling. Next slide. This is how I did the backdrop. Uh, I'm using masonite. I <clears throat> use these two by two framework. They're uh, approximately on 16 inch centers. And um, I'm gluing the masonite to the framework and I'm using a, a pneumatic stapler. Um, <clears throat> I could have used drywall screws, but I have this pneumatic stapler and uh, just works brilliantly. You know, you just clamp the mace. If you see the two smaller photographs in the bottom right, you see my C clamps holding everything in place. Then you simply, you know, put in as many staples as you think necessary. Bang, 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 bang. It just goes right in. Um, next slide. <laughs> Now, this is my little trick on uh, preparing the masonite. You know, when you, if you use countersunk drywall screws, or even if you use these pneumatic staples, you know, you get a hole where you had the, uh, where, you know, where you've put the screw or the staple. And if you sand masonite, it gets fuzzy. And if you just fill it with spackling compound, you're not going to get a smooth surface. So my little trick is to take shellac and with a disposable brush, 
basically soak those holes twice. And then when you sand them, it's like sanding plastic. It gets really smooth. And then when you fill it with your spackling compound, it's a one, one shot deal. You just put it in there and light sanding and you're done. It's perfectly smooth. And then I paint it with a primer and sealer. Now this is key. You have to use an oil-based primer if you're going to put up a photographic backdrop, backdrop because if you use a latex-based primer on the masonite, it has a great possibility that it will lift. If you use wallpaper paste or some of these backdrops, like in the case of the one I ordered, has its own adhesive, you can spray water on it. Yeah, so anyway, here's, and the upper left is the, uh, what it looks like when you hit it with shellac. The upper right is just hitting it with the, uh, after the sanding, hitting it with the sprackling compound. And then there's the sanding on the left, bottom left, middle and end. It is glass-like smooth. That's the other trick from the, you know, when I say no compromises, when I spend uh, what is going to be an absolute fortune for, I've already purchased one of them, a 24 inch by 35 foot photograph. And then the other one is 24 inches high by 45 feet long. I don't want to see any bumps or any uh, bubbles or any lifts from the, the base. So I'm spending a lot of time getting this just as good as it can possibly be. So go to the next slide. So here we are painting. This is that Zinzer oil-based. It really smells, by the way. You have to wear a respirator, or not a respirator, but a carbon filter mask and open up the windows in either end. It really, really smells, but um, goes away in a day or two. I wound up putting basically two, almost sometimes three coats here. And uh, it's absolutely glass-like, which is the goal here. You can see some of my fascia there is all done there. Um, that really stiffened up the layout. Okay. Now I've painted the uh, fascia a uh, natural green. Um, and it, you notice one thing I did mention, I put in LED lighting. I took that from the very first photograph. You remember that a single light and a fan that that's history. I pay attention to all the joints and putting in this MDF. If you look at the highlight of that right hand bottom picture, I mean, everything is just no compromises, just as good as it can possibly be, step by step by step. Okay. On the right, there is another new cabinet. That's uh, basic, basically finished. By the way, the scheme here, that little gap left between the fascia and the cabinet, that gives me access to all the wiring. And as you'll see in a later video, it gives me the opportunity to put in the electronics and some panels and voltmeters and digital voltmeters and Digitrax, uh, Loconet plugs, and it's, Really, if I do say so, pretty clever. You'll see in a subsequent uh, presentation how that worked out, but it, it worked out brilliantly. I'm trying to finish the whole bottom of the layout so that when you walk into the room, you know, my old layout looked like a hand grenade went off in it. That's not gonna be the case this time. No compromises. Next picture. This is more of the uh, fascia, it's all finished now, or the uh, backdrop's all finished, all ready for the photograph, which should arrive within late, later this week or next week. And it should be fairly, uh, pretty breathtaking photograph if I do say so. It's not mine, it's something I bought. Next one. <clears throat> I took this photo and threw in a, piece of foam to give you an idea what, what the scheme is. So the idea is that um, if I ever do have to take out 
if I have to move again, the largest piece of the layout will be 24 inches by eight feet long. Basically a four by eight sheet of two inch foam cut right down the middle, conveniently fits on the left and right of that island. And um, the idea is that because I use the L girder construction, I just use wood screws up from the bottom of those runners that I put in to hold the foam in place. Just simply remove those screws, lift the foam out, I get the whole layout. Last time I could only salvage the structures. So I think that's the last slide. Um, any questions from anyone? Yeah, how Tom, high is the yeah. bench work? Pardon me? How high is the bench work, the operating surface from the floor? The um, Miami stuff is 48 inches, and then I add two inches for the uh, foam. So you're at 50 inches. Now, that won't be the land of flat railroad. And I've been around long enough that <laughs> there will be, you know, contours and uh, hills and mountains, and it'll be deceptive that it, it won't be miles and miles of flat four by eight-ish railroad. Hey, Tom, just Tom. a quick qu question. Did you, did you think about, have you thought about on the plywood before you put the plywood in, basically veneering on the back on what's the bottom here, uh, you know, a thin piece of plywood? like you know veneer some sort of a door veneer door skin i mean we do that on our, yeah we do that on our modules on top to give something i'm thinking about instead of attaching that to the bench work free glue that to the back of the foam and it's when you go to take it out it's going to give you some more strength having that little bit of reinforcement on the bottom across the bottom of the foam i did actually think about that i i could still do it um you think it's necessary? That's, I guess, the foam. I guess the scenery. The foam, the foam uh, you know, our experience has been two problems with foam. One, it does tend to sag. Yeah. Well, when it's out over the open, even uh, across the foot. And, and by the way, it also shrinks. I mean, the other thing we've found is that the foam shrinks at the edges. And if you've got, you know, a wood piece at the edge and foam coming up to it, over time, the foam will shrink enough that you'll get a little ski jump right at the edge of the joiners. So, you know, two things to think about with foam, but the, the sagging would be my bigger concern. Even though it's only a foot, you may get a little bit of sagging there. I, I didn't, ex I think it makes, I hear what you're saying. I, my last rustic buff and old Gothic was two inch foam and it had some areas, 24 inches of, of, uh, span without i didn't have any sag but i think i think what you said about putting a piece of like luan or yep. quarter inch plywood underneath it in the event of an eventual move is probably a good idea i want to thank you for giving me even more work to do sorry yeah. about that <laughs> John. but i love the design i love the concept of being able to take stuff out in pieces like that without any time cut all the bench work out underneath. It's a pretty interesting concept. Yeah, what, what's really unique about this is the uh, the hybrid L girder construction, I think, because one of the issues on my old one is when I did try to salvage some of it, it just didn't work. It was all glued down to those runners. And I don't, to be honest, I don't intend on moving again, but who knows, you know? <laughs> Tom? Well, it also uh, reminds a, me, if you've seen uh, Ken Patterson's presentations, he makes his layout surface removable so he can take a section of the layout out and work on the scenery on his workbench and then drop it back into the layout. Well, on my um, modeling lifestyle that Jim was so kind to have me participate in a couple months ago, I built all my structures on uh, plywood. Yes. So I, I basically do d d little dioramas on plywood and then insert them on the layout and then integrate them into the layout. So that's sort of what you're talking about. I I, I don't really want to remove whole sections, <laughs> but but it's a it's a concept for sure. But when when I took apart the old rustic buff and old gothic, 
all my structures, which are all around me on bookcases here, you can't see them, but it took me less than an hour just to take those off the layout because I just broke them free and they're on, you know, half inch three, you know, substantial aircraft, model aircraft grade plywood, off they came. And, uh, you know, were, these were little mini dioramas that were basically finished on the workbench and then placed on the layout and integrated into the layout. Tom, Tom, I have a question for you. On your fascia board, you're using MDF. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a little hint. Like I've, I've worked with MDF before. If you do not paint all surfaces, that means all the way around, moisture will get into your MDF and it'll swell. Okay. You must paint all surfaces, back, front, and each edge. Yeah, it's, uh, I could do the back. So that's two things I picked up tonight. Thank you again <laughs> yeah. for adding more work. Because I, as I say, I, I put uh, a pat. It's, uh, the, uh, <laughs> it's glue. Yeah, the, only, the only way not to have to worry about painting all the way around on MDF is to have a climate controlled and humidity controlled room. That's basically uh, what I have. Yeah. Yeah. If if you have good humidity control and good climate control, you don't need to worry about it. But if you if there's any chance of having any humidity fluctuation and temperature fluctuations, extreme temperature fluctuations in the room, mm -hmm. I yeah, you paint all all surfaces of it. It'll be uh, 68 degrees, 70 degrees here year round. You know, it's air conditioned, heated. It's part of the house. It's not a separate garage room somewhere else. It has its own heating, ventilation, air conditioning. But I just it won't take me long just to paint paint the back of it, no problem. I have a you different also, question. You can also get exterior MDM. Uh, too late for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have a different question. Uh -huh. That section you have on the wall, you got a space between that and the wall behind it. Oh, that's for staging. I kind of wondered if you want to do that. Yeah, when I do the... Um, I should should have shown a track plan, except for the only one I have is in my head. No, no problem. But the um, there's a two track staging back there, and uh, I have I bought the Digitrax uh, detection module. I'm debating how I'm going to run that back there so that I don't run trains into each other. Um, I'm thinking about cameras, thinking about turning on and off track with a toggle switch. I, that would be an interesting question to the group here. If you have I would put cameras in. Cameras, yeah. Yes, that, that will work. I had a guy who did that in our club. And it's the only way you can now tell what's going on back there unless you can see it. Yeah, I'm going to do that. They're really cheap now, and I have them yeah. throughout my house anyway. So just it's not an. That's what I'm going to do. Plus, I'll have the track detection yeah. circuit. Uh, given the roof that you have there, another possibility, and. Uh, uh, a large layout I've been to, he had mirrors at a 45 degree angle over showing behind the backdrop. So you could see if you were looked up over the backdrop, I don't know if that would quite work with your ceiling, but you have the, the angle there already. <laughs> yeah. If it would be a non-obtusive, the whole idea, you know, I don't want anything to take away from the photograph and the white ceilings neutral, but if I could sneak a mirror in somewhere, maybe that's a, that's a, I'll look at that. There might be an area that yeah, I could do that. It wouldn't have to be a big one, just enough that you can see straight down yeah. on the track. It. Yeah. Okay. Well, my so next... Tom, Go ahead. Tom, as I told you, I didn't think you'd have to worry about correct questions from this group. <laughs> well, it's a good group. And um, I, if, if everybody's interested in uh, the next segment will either be the Digitrax uh, installation or the backdrop. The backdrops haven't arrived yet, so it might be the Digitrax, which is about 80% installed. The advantage of putting in the wiring now without the foam on is I don't have to be a contortionist and work under the layout with all this wiring right now. Now I can just walk around, put in the wiring, there's no tabletop, no foam, no plywood to get in the way. It, it's really working out really well. The only 
wiring they'll have to do are the little feeders to the bus, if you're all familiar with DCC. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that, I can basically run the feeders and use these suitcase clamps, if you're familiar with those, they just snap right onto the bus. Uh, by the way, I learned, I didn't know really too much about DCC. And um, I educated myself on YouTube. I don't know if you guys ever have seen the DCC guy, if, if you're familiar with that guy on YouTube. He's really a great guy on the uh, electronic side of the hobby. And uh, it was a real education. He, he, I, I got to meet him someday because he really, he's really, uh, he's cost me a fortune and all the stuff he likes to do. Uh, was it Larry, Larry Puckett? <laughs> yeah, Larry Puckett. He's got me with circuit breakers and he's got me with overloads and boost. I mean, I just went spared no expense. Who are you getting your backdrops so, from? I think it's called Backdrop. Uh, Just, I think it's called backdrop. Um, I'd have to look here real quick. If, let me Could check. Be backdrop warehouse? No, that's what I had before. The, the, the backdrops I have this time, uh, I'll have to, uh, without checking my email. I had backdrop warehouse before. That's photographic paper. And um, it's not very durable. And if you get paint on it or you get sculpt mold on it or plaster, you basically ruin it. This is a polypropylene uh, mat backdrop. Basically, they demonstrate spray painting it, putting sculpt mold on it, plaster on it. It's basically, you know, you can't really hurt it. It doesn't crease. So I, I chose a different, uh, I like the photographs better on backdrop warehouse, but this one's that I have is coming pretty nice. So Tom, one other thing that as you start looking at suitcase connectors, um, there are lots of interesting issues with suitcase connectors. Um, these, these new connectors called WAGO, W-A-G-O, and they're kind of a clamp connector. You just trim the wire, put it in, and you, you got a little thing you open and close. And it closes very hard on the wire and it'll handle anything from basically a 12 to a 24 wire in the same connector. And they're pretty brilliant. And the beauty of them is that you can disconnect stuff for troubleshooting, which oh, makes yeah. it a lot, a lot easier. The only downside is when you do the bus, when you put a connector on the bus, you have to leave enough room for the connector to go in and out of this connector thing. Cause they aren't, they just go through. You can't, you can't just, put it on the wire on a bus, you have to actually have the bus terminate into the connector and come back out. Oh. Use a three port on a bus, but um, we're rewiring a fairly large O scale layout. And we started using those. And I have to tell you, they're brilliant. Um, work, work a lot better than the suitcase connectors. The other thing is we're also using for the feed wires. You can buy 12 gauge zip cord. Yeah. Um, it's actually 14 gauge because it's Chinese 12 gauge which is actually US 14 gauge, um, but it's zip cord, aluminum, copper coated zip cord. Right. And for about 50 bucks, you 70 bucks, you can buy 500 feet. And that stuff works great because the one of these with DCC is you want to twist the wires so the wires are close together. Yeah, Turns out zip cord does that automatically because it's yeah. molded together. So yeah. yeah Larry, so, Larry Puckett mentioned that, that the zip cord, uh, you don't need to twist. and yeah. I, I just have 14 gauge stranded um, yep. twist. I twisted it together. It's copper. Yep. And I just recently did buy some Chinese uh, aluminum copper clad. You know, it was cheap. We'll see how it works. <laughs> yeah. I, I mostly have all 100% copper, you know. And the suitcase connector, I, I've only installed one so far. It worked pretty slick, I have to say. You lay the suitcase connector across the bus stick in the feeder wire, pair of uh, channel locks, basically squeeze it, the little aluminum tab down and then close her up. I mean, it was pretty impressive, but I'll, I'll look at your WAGO connectors, yeah. You can't uh, take apart a suitcase connector. Once it's in, it's in. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the issue when you go back to troubleshoot and 
especially when you're doing a rebuilding a layout, it's a lot more troubleshooting probably than a new install. But I've got everything. No, there's no direct wires for my circuit boards, which are numerous and the booster and the command center, everything goes to terminal uh, strips. There's no direct wire to the layout. There's terminal strips in between. So I have the ability to do what you're doing just by unhooking a wire. You know, you'll see that on my segment on Digitrax. You'll see how crazy I went with the wiring, you know. Okay, just make a comment on aluminum wiring. Uh, aluminum wiring, it's fine for some stuff, but for other stuff, don't do it. Uh, number one, copper and aluminum are dissimilar uh, metals. And if you want to do it, like in house wiring, that kind of stuff, you have to do it. You have to use the proper connector and you have yeah. to use um, stuff like uh, no locks on it. Otherwise, what will happen is the uh, aluminum will start pulling back because it's soft. Any place you get the heat and then cool, heat and cool on the wire it starts pulling back and eventually it will burn. So I would definitely stay lay away from aluminum wiring on your model railroad. Yeah, 90, 98% of what I have is 100% copper. I just had a Good, couple, that's the way to go. Keep it copper. A couple little spools are uh, Chinese bullshit. So we'll just see how it goes. Yeah. I, I'll tell you where I get this from. I am have been employed by Electrical Safety Authority here in Ontario. And uh, so we've had lots of issues over them wiring over the years. So, yeah, that comes from experience and seeing what it does. I'd yeah, I mean, with, advise everybody, stay away from it. With DCC, you're talking about my power supplies, uh, not that I'll draw it, but it's 20 amps. So you're talking about some serious potential. Yeah, you got you got heat available there. Yeah, so they could, I, uh, if it's 14 gauge, yes, you can heat it up. And yeah, you will I'll, get uh, that expansion contraction and the arcing. Yeah, it can cause copper. fires. I'm all copper off of that. In fact, the almost 99% of the layouts of copper. I just have two little 25 foot spools of the cheap stuff just because I wanted a different color for something. You know. <laughs> well, as long as you know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Tom, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We'll look forward to your uh, next segment on either the uh, backdrops, if they come in, or the uh, DCC.